nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So hello, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what NanoHub is all about. NanoHub has the motto online simulation and more. So what I'd like to do is um, show you what, this, what we mean by that. So what we want to do is really put simulation tools into people's hands. And the people we have in mind are not the computer geeks like me, because I know what SSH are and MPI and what a Unix command line is, but it's the experimentalists that have problems to solve and the educators that have concepts to teach. So really put, put things into use, but really people like uh, tool developers like me really have to also be willing to develop these tools for people to put them into their hands. And, and we do a whole lot more where we uh, have educational material that goes with these tools to explain what the concepts are. We deliver them on NanoHub as well and also in forms like podcasts and seminars and tutorials. And around that we really are building a community. Um, that is uh, of users and of contributors that do simulation, that do education. And to give you an idea of what we mean by that uh, online simulation, what I'm going to do is instead of showing it live right now, I wasn't sure what the network connection really was going to be. Um, so let me go in here. So, I'm going to show you a sort of a screen flow of one of the tool of two of the tools. So here is a tool called quantum.lab. It allows you to solve the single particle Schrodinger equation in, in different geometries like boxes, cylinders, domes, ellipsoids, pyramids. So if I choose a pyramid, I can do different geometry sizes. I can shine light in at different angles and I have the electrons at different temperatures or I can sweep that angle and if I start the simulation it runs pretty fast in a few seconds and it comes up with a visualization of a single uh, electron wave function. So here it was the s orbital, here's the px orbital, it's aligned in the x direction. Um, you can sort of validate a little bit by putting in a cut plane. Uh, so you can move that cut plane around to give you an idea. All of this is working interactively on the web uh, in this form. You can rotate it around and modify the cut plane, look at the different wave functions. So now here is the uh, PY-like wave function. It has a symmetry in the other direction. That's what, like what you expect out of simple quantum mechanical uh, simulations. And now you look at the, uh, the third-excited state and you would expect to see a PZ-like wave function, but really it, the symmetry has broken uh, and you see actually a, a lobe that's on the top in its apex and two side lobes on the bottom. So the geometry of the confinement has changed the wave function away from what you normally would have expected. You can play with the isosurfaces by moving the isosurfaces around. You can introduce new ones by clicking on them. And again, you can uh, uh, sort of see how these isosurfaces were added in the center. Now you see the further excited states. That looks like a two to one state. And the next one looks even more funky. There's like lobes that are overlapping with each other. Again, you see how the geometry of the device of these pyramidal dots really make uh, a, a difference on the internal wave function. So now we're gonna look at uh, some uh, energy states, and this is sort of a loop into the, energy, into the energy ladder of the states that you can look around in. You can look at uh, the allowed and not allowed transitions in the system. So here are the x-polarized uh, states that are allowed, transitions that are allowed. Here's an absorption that is uh, calculated, and here's the absorption for three different incident angles that was computed. Now, Here's the integrated absorption as a function of angle. 
we go back to the wave functions, go back to the input, and we change the device geometry around, just change the height of the quantum dot, the pyramidal dot, quantum dot to 5.5 nanometer, rerun the, uh, the case, and now we can look at the wave functions again, and we can look at the absorption in the 5.5 case, the 5.0 case, we can switch the results around, we can put it with the all button on the same uh, graph, we can change the geometry again to 6 nanometers, and then start to compare three cases uh, again, so it runs pretty fast. It runs the NEMO 3D code under the hood. Um, and here you see three absorption coefficients for three different heights. And you can sort of ramp through the, the different results and compare them. And you can zoom into data, so it's pretty interactive. You can pick out uh, results, you can hover over them, you can pan them around. Um, so it's not a static GIF image that is typically developed with a web interface, but it's a dynamic interface. You can hover over the values. And here again, you see how it's meshed um, to resolve these sharp peaks, and that's it. So here's the, another tool which is kind of like Nemo 1D. It's uh, an RT uh, resonance tunneling diode simulation tool. I want to highlight this one as well. So here's the resonance tunneling diode simulation tool, uh, RTD Negev on NanoHub. Um, it runs a little, uh, in a few minutes, we sped up the time a little bit, where now you see the resonance tunneling diode, it's a double barrier structure, you can ramp through the voltage, you see the central states in the, uh, in the central RTD. Uh, they correspond to transmission coefficients that vary as a function of bias. So here are the transmission coefficients. And the next thing is you get a current voltage characteristic in this RTD that is characteris characteristically N-shaped. You can change the charge model to a potential model to a hard tree charge self-consistent model. It runs a little slower, a few minutes. Um, and then you can compare again the conduction band edges and you can look at the charge density which is the critical element that's different. Now you see, actually see a quantum mechanical charge. You see the charges are rounded compared to the semi-classical charge which was assuming uh, uh, the Thomas Fermi type model and you see how the charge is piled up in a triangular shape against the barrier which ultimately results in uh, current voltage characteristics that are quite different. Um, and they have uh, uh, different characteristics to them. And if we now go in and make the structure a little bit asymmetric and make the right barrier, the barrier two, a little bit thicker and run, uh, hit the simulate button again, it runs for a little while longer. And we would expect to see charge accumulation in this device when this barrier here on the right is a little bit thicker. And in the next one, we will look at the charge density, I believe. Yes. And you can see charge piling up in the middle of the device and then emptying out. So you have charge pileup, uh, accumulation and depletion. And you can compare these IV curves and the IV is stretched out a little bit to the right. If I want to click on, have all of the IVs that were simulated, I can do that by clicking on the parameter button underneath. And now I can compare against, uh, again, the different, uh, device simulations that were done. So the key element is really here that you can interactively explore these devices and learn about them. So that gives you a, a little bit of an idea of what NanoHub allows you to do. And most of our tools are like that. And I want to put this into contrast what most people consider web development of, uh, or web deployment of tools. And we had done this, we started this at Purdue at 1995 with a system called PUNCH, Purdue University Network Computing Hub. And that was developed at a time where there wasn't even an Apache web server available, right? So they had to write their own web server to do this. And they developed these forms where you can hook in tools that can be launched on remote Unix machines. And that was quite fancy at the time. And the way it works is you fill in this web form, and then you get to this uh, page where you submit a run and you click on this 
refresh button, right? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And uh, what you see once you're there is you, you get a file browser and you can look at some files and uh, you can look at data files or GIF images. So, so here's a static GIF image. Well, try to zoom into that. Try to compare that to something else, right? You can't do it. You'd have to download the data on your own machine and put it in your own plotting package and you can't really ask what if questions anymore as easily. Uh, if you look at another output file, you can get something like this again. But at the end is, you ask yourself, what was my input, right? You lost the connection to what was your original question. Uh, did I enter these things right? And that's a typical symptom of no visual feedback and no interaction, okay? It's, it's really something that is more powerful than not having the tool at all, but it's not very user-friendly either. And the point is you still have to be a computer geek because you have to download your own stuff in your own visualization engine as well. So to make a case in point, uh, we had Shred, a tool developed by Dragica Veseleska since before January of 01. And you roughly see ballpark 10 users monthly using it, and then a couple of poor suckers using it in a classroom. Those are the spikes where somebody decides I'm going to use Shred for teaching um, of Poisson-Schrodinger equation. And I say poor suckers because they didn't come back, right? They didn't decide, well, this is a cool tool, it's going to change my life and my research and I'm going to do this, right? Then you see a sort of a phase change, like a, a growth of a factor of six or so, five or six. And that coincides with a conversion of these web forms for this tool into something interactive that I just demonstrated. Okay, nothing else. It didn't change anything else. But we increased the usage sixfold. And what's even more striking is we had before about 10 people downloading the source every month because they said, well, let me just try to download it and install it myself. You could still download it after the Rapture version was there. But people weren't that interested anymore in downloading the source and, and installing it and maintaining it and compiling it and figuring out how to use it. So, so really powerful graphical user interfaces matter. Okay? It's not a matter of just, all right, I'll put my stuff out there with a tarball, go ahead and download it. Okay? If you want to make your stuff useful, you ought to spend a little bit of time of making it useful. And we basically uh, think that users really don't want to download and install software. That's the, that's the proof. And we see that with most of these apps that we did the conversion in. So the same behavior was seen across all similar, similar converted tools. So to give you an idea of how this system works, I'm going to show you a system architecture of this. So from the outside, nanohub.org looks just like a, a normal website that has a content management system. But if you go into a, a tool page where you say, okay, I want to launch a tool, what happens is a, a, a virtual machine on top of a physical machine gets allocated and in that virtual machine we run a Unix application, a full-fledged Unix application with a real user interface and we pipe that interface to the user into the browser. So it's kind of like a remote desktop or VNC. If these things mean something to you, that's fine. If they don't, then consider it magic. Well, the good thing is now if you run, all this authentication has been, has been happening through this Maxwell's daemon. Now if you run a simulation, it could run in this virtual machine, if it's a lightweight application, but if it's a heavyweight application, it could go to a, a grid environment where these jobs could be launched on some remote machines. And all the authentication already has happened, right? It's behind the system, right? You don't have to have your own grid certificates and user certificates and MPI commands and SSH commands as a user. It's completely transparent to the user. Now, XY plots and simple plots are actually also delivered from this virtual machine but if you want to have fancy graphics like uh, 3D rendering of what I had demonstrated earlier, we have a visualization engine that sits in the back and we pipe the data into it. And when I interact with these 3D uh, rendering, 
uh, um, images, I actually interact with this visualization engine we call NanoViz. We, do, we have 3D volume rendering in there, and we can do a pi mole like um, um, uh, molecular uh, modeling as well, and just pipe the data to this rendering engine, and then pipe that, the, the output, to the user. And again, the user would be interacting with a rendering machine that sits somewhere in the world. Okay? It happens to sit at Purdue. So, the problem with scientific computing is not only the creation of the core engine, but the normal process is also that something gets created by a PhD student, and that one PhD student can use it, and maybe the advisor can use it, maybe, and that's it. There's a sort of a cruddy input deck, right, that is not documented, and uh, there is no user interface to speak of, right? You dump out the data in some arbitrary format and you put it into MATLAB or Origin or XM Grace, whatever your favorite plotting package is, and that's it. And so typically, there is no user interface, but if you really want to make your stuff useful to others, they have to have an interface. And that is where Rapture comes into play, where you can, uh, it was created at the NCN in November 2004. It's an open source package, and it can work uh, on, as a desktop application, and it can work for NanoHub. And what it does, it, uh, it really puts a wrapper around your simulation code, and you can write a sophisticated graphical interface like this that takes literally an undergraduate, to undergraduate student two days to create. It's actually very simple. And what's really cool about it is we're not asking you to rewrite your simulation code in Java, right? Which is, a, in general, a ridiculous thing for some people to ask, where they say, well, if you want to deploy on the web now, now you've got to rewrite your code. That's, that's pretty pathetic. So you can, if you wrote your code in C or Fortran or MATLAB or Python or Perl or Tickle, Rapture will work for you. You don't have to rewrite anything which is a, a quite a powerful thing. And that really allowed us to enable scientists and engineers like you to uh, develop their own graphical interfaces. It's not that we are in the process of, well, now you, your boss said, well, you gotta put this on the web, now you gotta hire a web developer that puts PHP wrappers around your code or rewrites your code in Java. It, you can leave it as is, as a Unix engine, put an interface on top, and then deploy that Unix engine. It's very powerful. And we have now over 140 tools online. And what I want to drive home is that most other science gateways that I'm aware of say, well, I have this tool, now I want to web deploy it, I gotta rewrite major chunks of it, so I need three full-time employees for say three years to do that process. That's nine so-called FTE. I can guarantee you that as a center, we don't have nine FTEs for all of these 140 tools, right? So we're doing something radically different. All of these tools are interactive. You can rotate molecules around, or you can uh, look at nanowires, you can look at DFT type calculation, or molecular dynamics calculations, or you can look at uh, MOSFET simulations. Um, so it is a broad variety of tools out there. What's cool also is it's a free account. Just confirm your email address so you don't have to know me or meet me at a conference. And still I see this happen all the time. I give a NanoHub talk and at the end of my presentation people come to me, hey, can you sign me up? I'm like, no, it's just fine. Just log on and you get on. You don't have to know me. Uh, you don't have to write a grant to, to get onto this computational resource. Uh, you can dispatch jobs on the grid. Uh, it's done automatically for you. So if you have high intensity jobs, it, it's done on the grid. Um, you can let it run, check back later from home, for example. There's an, a, a, a place called My Nano Hub where it manages all your, uh, all your runs. And you can close a laptop at work and, and, or a desktop and come back from home and check on your runs. It's completely transparent. There's an integrated, uh, integrated uh, uh, visualization engine that is uh, running seamlessly. 
that was developed at the, at the NCN. And uh, since grid computing really has to be hard, right? Not really. We can download results in a single click with all the authentication being done. So no grid certificates or things like that needed. And there is some 200 projects in this nanoforge.org where people have decided to deploy tools. Um, and it's an environment, it's kind of like SourceForge, but for the nano community, you can decide whether you want to do it open source or closed source, that is depending on you and your advisor and your agenda of how you like to proceed, but it gives you a space to work in. So again, NanoHub is about online simulation and a whole lot more, and we really are building a community around this in, uh, in the world. So here's the website. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's just a screenshot where we feature some tools in the middle, some online presentation and people, and it's about simulation, research, teaching and learning, contributing to the site and uh, networks. We have some 1,600 resources there now. Uh, I mentioned over 140 tools, so there's a lot of seminars, and most of them, uh, of these resources are in this Creative Commons license meaning that uh, we allow others to take that content and integrate it into their own courses as long as it's not commercial uh, use. Um, it's a typical Creative Commons license. There is a, a worldwide community. We have over 90,000 people in the last 12 months that utilize NanoHub. Uh, each of these red dots is sort of a user around the world. It has seen a dramatic growth over the years in 172 countries. Um, I'm sure you're aware in the U.S. all the university ha universities have a .edu at the end, right? Purdue.edu, MIT.edu, yourhaircare.edu, yourundertaker.edu. I mean, there's about 7,050 of those .edu's. We have at least one user at 17% of these .edu's. And nano is a really tiny area, and the pun is intended, uh, but that's a huge impact. I mean, to have, to, to reach 17% of all, of all of those studied use, and we have users at all top 50 engineering schools in the United States. In the last uh, 12 months, there were 72 classes in over 41 institutions that used NanoHub for teaching in the classroom. And if you compare this to this famous NASA chart, uh, of Earth at night, we're clearly keeping people up at night. So uh, with that, I want to highlight that I think what we do is really change uh, and evolve scientific computing. Uh, a few years back, if you wanted to do any scientific or HPC computing, you'd have to be a special person on a special resource. I mean, you speak your science and you speak ones and zeros and you connect it to a particular hardware that allows you to do this. Then this uh, idea of portals came about, and the idea was really to, to let others access all these resources. So in, you don't have to be a special red person, you're a normal yellow person. But it turns out that most of the times these portals were only used by specialists, because they're really not user friendly. And uh, away from that in, environment, a different group of people that was really focused on these other folks that have problems to solve and are not computer specialists, uh, they connected with each other and they created the system called Punch. So in 1995, they created this Punch system and almost instantaneously had a thousand users annually. And then NanoHub was created and we, we roughly stayed at a thousand users still. But then we made it interactive and um, had more materials, and now we're over 90,000 users annually. So we really are, in the U.S., considered a science gateway. There's some 30 of them or so, and we're probably the most uh, uh, prolific and have the most users. And really what this means is uh, we're forming communities now when people are not only users, but they can also share with other users. Possibly down the line, we want to share compute cycles uh, with the community. And we're creating other hubs there where people can also share maybe different things. And down the line, we would love to connect those hubs together. 
So this is a slide that's two or three years old already. And there was a sort of a plan to create these other hubs. Um, that is now actually happening where we have some nine hubs alive and running for completely different fields of science, like uh, thermal engineering, cancer care engineering, assistive technology, pharmaceutical design, uh, healthcare issues, and global, edu uh, global education. And we have a software we call Hub Zero, um, which is powering all of these hubs um, for these new communities. So as a summary, I'd like to say that uh, NanoHub and NCN is changing a couple of things, is changing the sharing of information. Really, these tools are a new publication. It's a new venue for you to you get your work out and to be useful. It's a new way for you to um, have uh, your own simulations be validated, where people can really see, is this what comes out, and what if I compare uh, this against my simulation, right? It's really aware of sharing and getting the word out. Uh, hopefully, we're really changing the expectations of experimentalists and educators. The idea really is to make simulation useful for those folks, rather than, oh yeah, that's the theory guy. He, he has a nice toy and that's fine. Uh, certainly, we have changed the pace of tool deployment. There's no other site like us that has that many tools online. And cyber infrastructure is really uh, uh, an important uh, new development in our technology portfolio, and we're changing the face of that by really um, enabling people to share and reach other communities. So with that, I'll take some questions. Yes? I would like to comment about uh, the target uh, of this kind of uh, web-based uh, computational tool about uh, the community of uh, computational uh, services. I say, uh, is it something that uh, uh, I think uh, will be suitable also for the other computational uh, people stuff, or is something uh, that will be mainly for uh, experimenters uh, teaching, uh, so a sort of make it easy calculations? Mm -hmm. So, I. So the, the comment or the question is, can this be useful for computational scientists, yeah. right? So I think it can, and I think it is to a certain degree already. Um, I consider myself a computational scientist. I think it's essential that I put my material on the NanoHub to be validated. I can run my simulations through NanoHub environments. All of my students are working on it. Um, to develop their own codes through NanoHub technology and with NanoHub technology. Uh, some students work on the back-end machine directly, um, but whenever possible I try to also be the guinea pig of, of making sure this actually can work for computational scientists. And the motivation really is that it could be uh, easy access to cycles, easier access to cycles. You don't have to write your own grants to get onto a, a machine that can deliver those cycles. Uh, number two, I think if uh, computational science is supposed to be the third leg of science next to experiment and theory, it better start to grow a little bit in terms of being validated, uh, being, being able to be validated, because part of an experiment is that you put your processes and and your, uh, uh, to, to process for experiment down in a paper and somebody else can duplicate it. But most computational science is not duplicatable right now. Right? I mean, nobody or few people published their code that actually generated this, right? And if you've ever written a code, there's so many little quirks, so many if statements on tuning of some parameters that you know nobody else in the world can possibly duplicate this. If it's not duplicatable, it's not science. Okay? So if computational science wants to fess up and be science, it needs to be duplicatable, and we need to find venues for people to share their methodologies in a way that's open and duplicatable. And this might be just a venue to do that. So, sorry, that's the long answer of why it... I also think that 
Sam is a very good scholar in this uh, vision of uh, this stuff is that uh, it makes it uh, also much, much easier comparing uh, mm-hmm. various softwares uh, because uh, usually there is just a few in which you are very skilled in books that you are not seeing and that uh, you don't compare usually so much because it's too difficult learning and deeply right. uh, many softwares. I mean, from my personal experience, it allows me to run codes like Avenit that I would never run, right? Because I I just don't have the time to learn all of the quirks and intricacies of Avenit as an ab initio calculation. But I I know I need to get my feet wet into it if I want to do atomistic type simulations.